everybody. I'm Joel Salatin, and I have the uh, really distinct and, and honor, uh, pleasure and honor of uh, being here on stage with, uh, I'll get all teary here in a minute, with an American treasure, a true American treasure, Dr. Temple Grandin. We had our at our farm several years ago, and um, it was the most special morning. My relationship with uh, Dr. Uh, Temple goes back to literally my teenage years. You're a little older than I am, I think. Yeah. And it was kind of the first article that Farm Journal ran about you and your work. And uh, at the time, we had a... Um, we had a kind of makeshift uh, head gate and, you know, a two-man, one guy pulled the rope and, uh, you know, all this jazz and none of it worked. And, and uh, for us, you know, working cattle was like torture, you know, just can we mow hay? Can we, you know, can we go pull weeds, you know? And um, I read that article and uh, went out and, um, and ripped out everything that we had and rebuilt it according to the, the kind of the, the rules of, of turning toward light and going out where they, wanna, where they came in, that kind of yep. idea. And, um, and it, it revolutionized everything. Revolu and we have now worked thousands and thousands of cattle through that. One person can work it through. It's not as sophisticated as the arrangements that she sells for, uh, you know, for the big commercial operations. But it's a homemade, and, um, and I just can't say enough about what, uh, what Temple brought into our lives as a small farm to be able to handle our animals um, stress-free and, and actually enjoyably, you know, to, yeah. to, to have a system where they wanted to go where we want them to go. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. So um, my, I, I salute this. Uh, grand lady of, uh, of low stress animal behavior. So I've got some, so our format this morning, I've got some questions um, that, that I'll, that will hopefully tease out of um, Dr. Temple, the, some, some of the things that we may not hear otherwise. And, uh, and it, it's, it's everything from animals to autism. You, you, you can, you can go seamlessly between those worlds, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so, uh, so we'll go through those. And if we have time, Hopefully, we'll have time to, enter, to uh, entertain questions from you all um, uh, as we go along. So, my first question is, I'm buying some calves, and what are some tips and tricks? I really appreciated you yesterday talking about fear. And um, what are some tips and tricks to, when you're, we're, we're buying some calves, introducing them to our our place, um, some tips or tricks to to get them to settle, to get them to settle quickly and acclimate to their new new surroundings. Well, you might want to just feed them. It's really important that an animal's first experience with something new, like a new place, a horse with a horse trailer, or even going to the handling facilities is a good first experience. Like you might just walk them through the handling facility and then feed them. Because if first experiences with new people are really bad, they don't forget it. They absolutely don't forget it. When we were working on training um, antelopes to cooperate with veterinary procedures, the veterinarian who had shot them with the dart gun in the past couldn't work with them. He was the bad person. And it didn't matter what you dressed him up in, uh, they recognized him. And so, so the, the chances of, of, of making a mistake there early on are, are higher than making a mistake, you know, once they've gotten real acclimated. Well, that's right. Also, the, the genetics of the cattle has an effect. You know, high strung, really nervous cattle, that when they get scared, they get more scared. See, both genetics and environment affects behavior. And when you say an animal's high strung or nervous, that's an animal that when it does get scared, it gets more scared. It has a bigger reaction. The other thing I discussed yesterday is if the animals do get all upset, Give them 20 minutes to half an hour to calm down. Give them time to calm down. That applies to every animal. A cat at the veterinarian that's a furball, shut the exam room door, leave it for half an hour. Dog, any of them. 
If you've been in a near miss with a car accident, I was in a near miss one time with a uh, two by six came off a trailer on the freeway and I managed to avoid hitting it. Uh, it took me 20 minutes to calm down. Uh, and for the, some of the swear words to stop that I will not repeat, but uh, it's the same. You see, you can get instantly scared, but it takes time to calm back down and for the stress hormones to go back down. Yeah, it does. And the, um, the, the perception of how bad the situation is has an effect on, on the length of time it takes to calm down, I assume. Well, and the animal's high strung uh, will take more time to calm down. I was just out at a ranch in Missouri, and somebody decided to fly a kite. And the horses had never seen that before, and they went berserk and ran back to the stable. You see, because it was all of a sudden something new that just suddenly appeared. See, the thing about new things is if animals can voluntarily approach them, and I showed this yesterday, some red steers coming up into a box, um, then something new is interesting. But if that box was uh, flying through the wind, that's going to be scary because that suddenly appears. New things are both scary and attractive. And, and new, things that are, new things that are stationary are not as scary as new things that are moving. Well, that's right. And if you, like, if you put a, one of these folding chairs out in the middle of the pasture, I guarantee you every cow will come up to that chair. Mm -hmm. But let's say you're out riding and all of a sudden it saw the chair. That's where you might get bucked off. But when the or, cattle, or, if a, or if a wind came up that's and right. that chair suddenly started cartwheeling across the pasture. Oh, that's going to make them panic. <laughs> and there was a case one time where a kid rode a bicycle through a big feed yard and uh, nearly stampeded the feed yard. And some of the big scaries are flags, bikes, and balloons. And now we got to deal with drones. Uh, we had a very dangerous situation at our equine center with a photographer uh, went at horses with a drone like a plane coming in for a landing. It took 20 minutes for the horses to calm down to get rideable. And then he did it again. Uh, no. Now, if the drone had just hovered up in the air, it would have been okay. But it came in like a plane coming in for the landing. I don't know what this guy was thinking of. It was so dangerous and stupid what he did. Yeah, I, I know your, uh, your background is primarily cattle more than anything else. Yeah, that's the uh, biggest. We, 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 have a, we have a lot of chickens. And I can tell you the drones, the drones and the chickens, uh, they don't like a drone either. I mean, they see that drone. It looks like, a, looks like an eagle to them. Well, that's you know? the thing. It's a predator in the sky. Yeah. So the chickens are going to run for cover. Right. And if you have outdoor chickens, lots of times they'll, they'll go out and forage further if there's some bushes where they can go get cover. So, so one of the things that especially homesteaders and small, uh, uh, small holders do, w w the reason I wanted to ask that initial question about settling uh, animals when they come is that, um, that a lot of small homesteaders, we're not, we're not transporting. Our, our cattle aren't used to being transported. You know, you, you go buy you two. You know, you're, That's you're, right. And, and, so, and so for animals that are, that are in... Uh, tend to be in small groups, low, small scale places, uh, a trailer transport is actually more scary than something that's been on, or on and off a trailer several times well, in its life. Well, that's actually right. And if you, if you buy a single animal that's never been alone, that's going to be very stressful. You know, just, just the fact of being oh, alone. They don't like being yeah. alone. All your herd animals, cattle, goats, sheep, all of those cattle, do not like being alone. And I've seen them go absolutely berserk because they're trying to get back with their buddies. Yeah, so that, that's why that, that nice, docile, um, uh, you know, a Scottish Highlander <laughs> that's so cute that you saw in that guy's field with the, you know, uh, that you went up and, and scratched his nose when he steps off your trailer at your place. Well, that's the problem, now, because suddenly, now all suddenly, of a sudden he's alone. He's alone. So if you could buy two cute Scottish Highlanders, <laughs> you might be better off. Oh, that's good. That's good advice. Okay. Well, I think uh, so. So the thing is to do is is feed feed them like like put some really good hay or yeah, uh, right. something down so they have a treat yeah. uh, as soon as they step off, and and then and then don't crowd them. Just 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 
let them in the corral well, let them, and, 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 and let them, them, and a, let them and be. Put them in a big enough pen because if these animals have a big flight zone and you put them in a small pen yeah. and then you're standing there by the fence, they're running back and forth because they're trying to get you out of their flight zone. Uh -huh. So if they're doing that kind of behavior, you want to back off. Back off. I'd rather put them in a bigger pasture. Yeah, and um, then gradually you can, uh, sometimes you can walk with them. Sometimes that helps. Um, you know, it depends upon how flighty they are. Right. So, so um, this flight zone thing is a really important thing to understand that a, that a cow, because their sides, their sides are on the, their eyes are on the sides of their heads, they, they can see their peripheral is way more than That's ours. That's right. How, how much is it? I mean, they, they, they can see all but like 30 degrees or something. There's a little spot right behind the rear end where they have a blind spot. And you don't want to stand in that blind spot. If you do that, the cattle will try to turn around and look at you. They want to know where you're at. There's a tendency for them to turn and look at you. And they'll do that when you're just outside the flight zone. So, so, so if, you, they're, if, if, they're, if they keep circling back at you, you know you're stepping mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want, you don't want in, to stay. In, into where they can't see you. Yeah, there's a blind spot right behind their butt. Mm -hmm. And are they, otherwise, when they're grazing, they can see all the way around. See, cattle's and sheep's eyes are designed for scanning the horizon. We have like a round fovea mm -hmm. in the in human eye, mm -hmm. uh, but in the grazing animal eye, it's actually a streak designed for scanning the horizon. And they don't like something behind their butt where they can't see it. Right. So, so for a, for a person you know that's fairly new to this, um, if, if an animal, um, correct me here, uh, Temple, if an animal is responding to you, that doesn't mean you're necessarily in their flight zone. Well, let's say you just want to make an animal move. You enter the flight zone, it moves a bit. Now, when it does what you want it to do, then back off. Yeah. Reward it for moving where you want it to move. And a really common mistake people make when the cattle's just ready to come out of a pen and go out of a gate is to give an extra push. Mm -hmm. That's when you don't give an extra push. Right. Back off. So if, Back they're, off. if they're going the way you want them to go, the way to take all the stress off, as long as they're going where you want them to go, then kind, kind of follow them rather than push That's them. right. Follow them, let them lead you. you and want to, when they do what you want them to do, you want to reward that behavior by taking the pressure off the flight zone. Right. And they do what you want them to do. Now, another mistake I talked to several people yesterday about is accidentally rewarding bad behavior. There was a milk cow, and she was kicking when she got during milking when she got can, halfway. Can you, can you believe that's my second question right here? This my is second a question common, is common, a kick, kicking milk cow, how to fix it. All right. Well, let, the, one thing you've got to make sure you don't do is accidentally reward bad behavior, like pushing and shoving on people. If you put the feed down when they're pushing and shoving, you just rewarded pushing and shoving. What you want to do is they stand back for just a second, then you put the feed down. Or you're switching pastures and they're shoving around the gate. They're shoving up against a, you know, a, a four-wheeler. Don't put the feed down when they're pushing and shoving. And then their manners can just get worse and worse and worse and worse because you've rewarded pushing and shoving and you didn't realize that you had done that. So they give one little hint of plight behavior, then you put the feet down. And with the dairy cow, I think what happened with her, we were just discussing this yesterday, she'd get halfway through her grain and then she'd kick and the, uh, and the person gave her more grain. You just rewarded kicking. Maybe we need to feed her after you milk her. No, you've accidentally rewarded kicking there. So is there a is is there another trick? I mean, there's there's uh you know there's there's hobbles, and you know just um, drill down on that on that kicking milk cow a little bit. I well, mean, you also can get kicking because she's sore. That might or maybe her you know if you, her udder's not a very nicely shaped udder, so she's harder to milk because she might be sore. I. Um, could possibly be making her kick. Uh, yeah, a lot of times uh, this is why you know the old uh, standard milkmaid. Um, a lot of times women milkers were a lot gentler on cows than men. You know, go in and grab. You know, um, you want to you want to kind of be gentle. Um, well, the other you, thing you want to do talking is talking about a gentle part of a woman here. You know, no, so. that's right. You, you, the other thing you want to do is don't surprise it. Mm. Um, 
The other thing I talked about yesterday, you don't pat animals like this, that's hitting. Stroke it, stroke it. Um, one thing that cattle really like is to be stroked right here, and they'll mm -hmm. put the head up like this. That makes them, you know, they're also real submissive. They're not going to butt you in that, in that position. I'm reminded of a, of a story I heard about a, a Quaker that had a, had a milk cow, and she, um, she put her foot in the bucket. Okay. And uh, he said, you know, bossy, you know, straighten up. And uh, so he cleaned out the bucket, started milking again. She put her foot back in the bucket. And he, uh, he said, <clears throat> now, you know, bossy, thou, thou must, thou must um, settle here. And uh, talked to her sternly and cleaned out the bucket, started milking again. And um, she put her foot in the bucket again. And he says, now, bossy, thou knowest that I will not smite thee. Thou knowest that I will not strike thee. But I'll sell thee to the Presbyterian down the road, and he'll knock the snot out of thee. <laughs> hmm. uh, any any more tips for for uh, uh, you know? Yeah, lots of times when we milk, we you know we give them a little bit of grain, give them a little bit of treat uh, to settle them. Uh, any, any other trick for for like a, a a cow that's just got a you know? Well, like you take a, like a, a young a bad you attitude. take a young heifer. Um, you know, this is like a new experience. Um, you know, what some people have done even in the big dairies is let them just walk through the milking parlor, so that's not new. If you can get her used to having udder handled before she freshens, that can help. You see, what you want to do is reduce the novelty of the situation. Mm -hmm. You know, get wow. used to having her udder maybe washed off. That can be a really helpful thing. Um, and then some cows are sore. And my student just got finished doing a study during COVID where she took the records, the computerized records from a big, huge dairy and looked at the new heifers on their first milking versus the experienced cows. And those new heifers, you'd expect them that they were going to kick to do it right away. No, they were doing it a week later. And well, because I that's think, when they got sore. I think they started to get sore is, is what happened. Huh. So what's the, what's the cure for sore? Well, one of the things I think... Uh, a lot of these problems were in very high producing cows. And there's a condition that they can get called udder edema, where it's not mastitis, it's not infected, but the lymphatic fluid makes the udder swell. And my student, Cora Akama, did a study on that. Uh, she's now a dairy extension uh, specialist. Um, and she found that in, when she milked cows in her dairy that they would kind of ouchy. And she did a study and she showed that cows that had more udder edema we're more ouchy. And I think that some of that's related to it. we're putting so much genetic selection into production. And then now we've got problems with some of the very high producing cows with uh, getting them to breed back. I like to look at genetics sort of like a, a national budget. If I put everything into the economy, meat, milk, or eggs, I shortchange infrastructure, like confirmation, heart, lungs. I may also shortchange the military, which would be the immune function. All of these things require energy. Now, you have a dairy cow that's a lower producing dairy cow, you're probably less likely to have this problem. Okay, so, so this, this runs to, a, to a, um, you know, a kind of an industry-wide issue where we've been, we've been uh, genetically selecting for a long time for just production, production, a a as if we can compensate for production forever with antibiotics or, or, or with, you know, other things. And, um, and, and so we've, we, we've kind of traded the devil for the witch here. Uh, what you have to do is back off some. Mm -hmm. The problem with problems like leg conformation issues, we have some problems with that in beef cattle and in pigs where the legs are too straight or the animal walks on the dew claw things or the two nubbins on the back of the leg. Pigs and cattle, both those dew claws should be off the ground. And... Some of these problems have crept up slowly. I call it bad becoming normal. Mm. And uh, leg confirmation issues kind of crept up. And we've had a congestive heart failure problem in Angus cattle that's crept up slowly. And uh, now we're going to have to back off. Um, when, now that you, when you say back when off, when I say back off a little, uh, don't back off a little bit on the milk production, and then you can have a, you know better reproduction. Because the dairy cow's gotten, the Holstein gotten harder and harder to breed. You see, the thing that people have a difficult time with is what is optimal. And then the other thing is immune function. 
It takes energy to operate the animal's military, which is the ability to fight disease. And I'm a big believer in measuring things. You can have, there's scoring charts for utter edema. There's leg scoring charts for uh, leg conformation. Those are things we need to be not selecting that. But you put everything into the economy, and you tend to get bad feet and legs. And that's happened in pigs and that's happened in cattle, in beef cattle, dairy cattle, and pigs. And of course, uh, again, poultry. Um, I, I, I'll bring up poultry because I'm, a, you know, I, okay, I know no, a little more really about into, poultry. But right. you know, the whole um, uh, woody woody breast issue in, in poultry uh, is an example of again the poultry industry pushing chickens, pushing pushing, pu pushing and, chickens and then so how, fast. Uh, and uh, now they've worked on the leg. They're like the modern broiler's got a tree trunk of a leg. Yes. But we're, there's concerns about the woody breast. Yes. And concerns about, well, what about disease resistance? Right. Uh, you know, it's putting everything into making breast meat. And what you probably need to do is you back off some. That doesn't mean you go back to the most old-fashioned chickens. Because the problem with that is that takes 15 to 20 percent more feed. Mm -hmm. So maybe you back off a little bit. And what is optimal? You see, the problem is if you only see your own animal, you don't realize that you're getting into a mess. That happened with lameness in dairy cattle. And there's been three studies that have shown that when you ask a dairy producer, estimate how many lame dairy cows you have, and these would be big farms, they underestimate by half. Then when they measure it, they're shocked to, to see how high it is and how bad it is. But you see, if you don't measure it, it creeps back up. Now, one of the reasons why I was seeing these things, I go to a lot of places and I see a lot of different animals. And I remember years ago when they just bred pigs for rapid gain, gigantic loins, and lean back fat, and they ended up with a hyper-excitable pig that bit tails and fought. Yeah. And they were really awful pigs. And I noticed it because I'd go over to this old John Morrell plant in Sioux Falls. This would have been back in the early 90s and the late 80s. And you'd see pen, these new hybrids, a pen of those, next to a pen of Yorks. And when you shook the gates, the hybrids went berserk and the Yorks didn't even get up. And then the tail biting was just obvious, that there was a genetic effect is, here. Is that when they started uh, docking the tails? Well, they've, they've docked tails on pigs for years. Long time. But um, you see, they didn't realize how nasty some of these pigs were getting. Because if you don't have other pigs to compare them to, you don't see it. And I remember getting in a big fight with the genetics company. This is what had been back late 80s. And they said, well, what do you know about genetics? And I go, I have one qualification. I go over to that John Morrell plant, and I see more different kinds of pigs in adjacent pens than you've ever seen. And then it's obvious that your pigs have got a problem. Huh, so that, those, those were pens of pigs ready to be slaughtered. That's right. The pens they they of were pigs. waiting to be slaughtered. And well, they're in. They bring them in. They unload them from the semi. So you got... Yeah. You got uh, the hybrids, like in the first pen, you might have some purebred Yorks in the next pen. This is before pigs all became hybrids. Some duraki looking pigs in another pen, and I'd go through and shake the gates. And the hybrids would rear up, screech, and tip over backwards, and the next pen of pigs wouldn't even get up when I shook the gate. And then the difference in the tail biting. It was obvious. Now, nobody deliberately breeds a nasty pig, but they were just breeding for the, uh, the three economic traits, and they didn't have any other pigs to look at. So this is a case of bad becoming normal. They didn't realize the problem they were causing with these pigs. Yeah. So, so all of us, all of us tend, to, uh, tend to just assume that whatever, whatever we see every day, um, well, that, just, that must be the way it is. Well, that's and, what and I call bad, a, bad becoming normal. Yeah. And this is why I want to measure things. I have a website, grandon.com, with um, lots of information on it. I've got a textbook on proving animal welfare, practical approach, where you measure things like lameness, you can measure behavior, and you manage stuff that you measure. In the, in, in a, if you were, if you were selecting for a chart, um, you know, one, one of the big problems in homesteading is people name their animals, yeah. you know, and, 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 and there's, um, there's only, you know, uh, a few chickens, there's a couple pigs, yeah. there's a couple cows. And so um, we tend to, uh, uh, very small scale, uh, people get attached to them. Oh, yeah. And, um, and, 
and culling, culling becomes a problem uh, or, or whatever. We, we don't want to cull because, you know, Amy over here is the milk, uh, the cow is, uh, she's named, you know, we don't want to yeah. cull. And so, um, so speak to the kind of the, the human, the human need or aspect of why culling is important. Well, sometimes you've got to get rid of an animal. Let's say you have a, a, a cow that just continuously keeps kicking. She's going to send somebody to the hospital. Then you're probably going to have to sell her. And uh, when I milked cows um, uh, back when I was in graduate school, and even in high school, um, well, we had this one cow, and she had real bad, poor teats. And if I didn't put the machine on her exactly right, she'd aim or kick. She'd grind my her hand, my hand into a bracket. She hit, she kicked another student really badly. I, I think that's a cow would sell. Uh -huh. She was hurting too many people. I mean, she was nearly breaking people's hands. Um, you know, that's, you know, you, I want to sell it. Now let's talk, when we're talking about aggression, let's talk about bulls. I want to talk about bull safety. Um, one of the most dangerous bulls is a hand-reared pet, bred, uh, raised alone and then when he's 16 to 18 months old, he's feeling the hormones and he wants to prove he's a man. So instead of going out and attacking the other cattle, there's no other cattle there, he attacks men, people, and kills them lots of times. Really, really bad. So let's say you have an orphan bull calf, no cow to rear it on. Let's make a steer out of it. I'd like to just get rid of the problem. I saw a hand-reared pet just last year put one of my clients right up on a fence and, and I, normally I wouldn't scream at animals, but I screamed at him really, really low, really super loud to stop it, and he did. Uh, and, but it's important that... Tem Temple, Temple needs that, no, need, Temple, you know how to talk bull. Well, yeah, uh, this was very dangerous. <laughs> I, I remember it as well, and it just was wow. last year it happened. And the best way to prevent these kind of problems is if it's, um, have, he should grow up with other cattle. It's not a tameness issue. It's mistaken identity. That bull has to grow up knowing that he's cattle. So when he gets to be sexually mature, he's going to go out and go get a shoving match with, a, with another bull. Mm. And that's going to make things a whole lot safer. But the hand-reared pet that's reared alone has killed a bunch of people. Wow, uh, that's, and, that's, a, profound, that's and, a profound statement. And yeah. this is something... Um, this particular guy didn't want to give up his hand-reared pet. So I said, go down to the sale barn, buy the biggest boss cows you can find. And they bought a monster Charlet, and uh, he started putting them in his place, and that helped. But I want to work on preventing this problem. And uh, if, you don't, if, it, if you don't have a cow to raise it on, making a steer out of it solves the problem. And it's a guy thing. And they go after men. They know the difference. <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're not stupid. No, I, well, that's a, that, that's a profound thing to remember as small farmers and small holders uh, to realize this, this um, uh, temperament, now, temperament well, it's issue. Well, really, it's not really a temperament. It's a learning thing yeah. because they, if they grow up with other cattle, then when he gets to be sexually mature, he's going to go fight with the other bulls. But let's say he just grows up alone just with people. Now he's feeling he's got to be the boss. He mm. does it to a man, a yeah. person, because there are no other cattle. He doesn't know he's cattle. You see, this is where you can really get into a problem with this. Good. All right. Well, sh shift gears a little bit. Um, so on, on, a, on a small homestead, um, the folks here at the Homestead Festival are probably not going to buy a genuine... Dr. Temple Grandin, you know, corral set up for however many thousands of dollars that is. No. And so could you give us a few, so, so a, lot of, a lot of folks here, you know, we're going we're gonna to kind of uh, set up a, well, uh, you know, a, a bootstrap, poor boy kind of Okay, uh, well, uh, I've got a, uh, I've a got work, a, work, working pen. Well, what, I, what are some tips and some really well, helpful things you I can have give got, to us? Um, you know, I've got two books. I got my humane handling, that's got all the big fancy expensive stuff in it yeah. that you have to build rollers. But I also have Temple Grandin's guide to working with farm animals, and it has some very simple facilities that you can make out of portable panels. And it was made for the small farm. 
that use some of the same principles, but they're much, uh, easy, you know, much very, very simple. All the catwalks are gone. You work them from the ground. Uh, Temple Grandin's Guide to Working with Farm Animals. And while we're talking about books, I'm unfortunately on a very tight schedule, and we have to be packed up and leaving at noon. And uh, uh, if you want one of those books, you might want to run over to the book stand right <laughs> in the back there and buy it now. Yeah. Because uh, we do have to go. I have a meeting in Boston. Kind of had a little scheduling issue, and I would have yeah. liked so to you, stay here longer. Right. So you've got, you've got to zip right out of here. I have this, to zip right out of here. Over. That's the problem. So if you... Um, so Temple's books are going to be packed up pretty quickly after we're done here. Um, our books will, will still be here for a while uh, after that, so uh, not a rush there. But uh, what, so, so, um, so, so talk about uh, a little bit of uh, light and things like that in, in, a, in a situation All right, let's like talk, that. Let, here's a situation that would be really bad. You've got a barn, and you've put your cattle handling facility with portable panels inside the barn, and it's a real sunny day outside, and the cattle won't go in. This is what I call the dark movie theater effect. Now, if you put lights in there, let's say you work cattle at night, and you put lights in that building, they'll go right in. But what you're going to have to do if you get the dark movie theater effect is to have a way they can see through the barn, where you maybe take out a wall and you put a white translucent a panel in. You may have to, you may have to do that. Um, because they... Or if you work them later in the day, they'll go, go right in. I've seen facilities where everything worked just fine, uh, you know, like when it wasn't real bright. Like a cloudy day, it would work. But on a real sunny day, you get that dark movie theater effect, and it's a huge problem. And they need to be able to see through that barn. You may have to cut a hole in the wall and then put a piece of white translucent plastic in so that they see light through the building. Another thing that animals will do is they will stop wherever there is a change in the flooring, like going from a dirt floor to a concrete floor, for example, in this barn. And one way to help improve that is just put some dirt up on the concrete so you don't have a sharp line between the concrete and the dirt. Just scuff dirt up on it. I have found that that has worked. Now, some of the portable facilities, they've got pipes that go across the ground, and the cattle don't want to walk over that. Again, put dirt in there. Cover up those pipes. The more, the, the more same you can make it. Now, unfortunately, I wish I still didn't have to talk about non-slip flooring. I just couldn't believe it. We went into a brand new, nice community college layout with a glass smooth floor. Absolute glass smooth floor. Just atrocious. Um, now, a dirt floor is non-slip if it's dirt. But these are just some really, really uh, simple things. And vehicles parked along beside your facility can often cause problems. Get the vehicles away from it because they have all kinds of shiny reflections. That's just simple, simple things that you can do. You see, one little piece of string that hangs down can cause a problem. I think, I think uh, what we have learned from you... Uh, a temple is if you're if you're finding that working your cows is a is a nightmare, all right, is yeah. a nightmare. It's probably not the cows. Ch I mean, except unless there's some really roguish well, cow. Well, there's some but, roguish but, but, cow. You but but, to, but generally right. speaking, 95 percent of the time, if if working cows is 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 something that everybody in the family says, oh no, we've got to do that. You know, because it it just feels like you never, like like you can never get them to want to do what you want them to well, do. If, you work if, cows, if that if that's the case, it's it's something it's something endemic in your in your situation. It's not the cows. All right, let's talk about calming down when you work cows. There's a lot of things that you can learn in stockmanship, but you're not going to learn anything if you're out there arm waving and screaming. And the problem with screaming is it has intent. They know you're mad at them. Where, okay, you got some fancy generators over there. They just sit there. They're, they're real quiet ones because they're the ones they use for movies. And, but it just sits there and makes a noise that's continuous. It doesn't have intent. Where screaming at cattle has intent. So calm down. Let's say you bring the animals in and they are excited. They got scared and, they, and they're acting really badly. And take a half an hour break. Take a half an hour break. 
to let them calm down. Okay, how do we know that they're scared? They got poo dribbling down the backside. They are scared because you scared the poop out of them. And if you can handle your cattle and not have poop diarrhea come out of them, that, that's a sign of severe stress. Another thing, a little less stress is tail switching. Horses will do that before they kick you. The milk cow might switch her tail before she kicks you. Yeah. But they, uh, eye white is a sign of fear. But if, they had, if you had a bad time getting them into the crowds, give them a half an hour break to calm down. Real simple thing to do. Another big mistake that people make is uh, you're bringing cattle up to the crowd pen that leads to your single file shoot. Bring up small groups. And I think on a lot of these small farms, it's like three cows you bring up at a time. Good handling is going to require more walking. Now, there's a drone right now up there. Now, it's just sort of hovering. That's probably not going to cause a problem. But um, now I'm seeing myself riding a horse, and the drone came at me like a plane coming in for the landing. And the photographer made sure I couldn't get to him because I was not going to say very nice things to him. For what he did, it was very dangerous. That drone just sits up there. That's probably okay. Yeah. That's not going to cause a problem. But one one of the things that we've learned from uh, from Temple Grandin's work is um, is that that animals. Again, we're talking about uh, vehicles parked next to your corral. Yeah. Talking about the way the light comes through the the the, the doorways and things. Animals, or, or you know. Uh, a pipe changing from, from dirt to concrete. Yeah, that's or, right. All that stuff. We as humans, we can look at that and we can analyze it. But an animal, they're simply, they're simply reacting to it. They, they can't sit there. They're not engineers. Uh, they, well, they, they can't, get they can't to, analyze it. An experienced it. dairy cow will walk over a drain in a milking parlor. But the new heifer is going to stop. Another thing is if there's something in your facility that the cattle don't like, They'll stop and look right at it. They will show you the things you, they don't like, a piece of string on a fence, something like that. They'll show that to you. And then you take that piece of string out of there. So, so if the cows are, are, are moving in and, they're, um, and, and you notice that, well, right here they always stop. They always stop. The answer is to step in there and just look and see, is, and there, is there light? Is there thread? Is there a spider web? Is there... Is there something? Well, we had a, a shadow I called the spider monster that appeared in one of the big plants last year. I was there. Everything was working just fine in the morning. I go out there at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and there's this thing that looks like a spider in the middle of the crowd pan, and it was a shadow from the overhead structure that appeared for about one hour uh, during the day. Then the guy, then the manager, call, one of the managers calls me up at night, and he's freaking out because the cattle went halfway up the chute and stopped. And I said, I want you to go back out there. And I want you to bring calm, really calm ones and watch where your leader looks. And he took a picture of where the leader looks. And there was a little LED light on the side of the building. And they took that away, fixed it. And I say, that, that steer will show you the thing he doesn't like. He'll show it to you. Huh. Wow, that's profound. So in the end, you, you work a lot in the industry, you know, large-scale yep, operations. That's right. um, what, are, what are you seeing in the industry as far as, you know, like, what's the number one animals, reason animals get sick? Uh, what's, you know, what, what are you seeing trends that, that, concern you, we, that concern you in the industry? We have problems that have gotten better. Cattle handling's improved across the industry. That's the good thing. Cattle handling's a lot better than it was 20 years ago. No question about that. But then we have some other things that have gotten uh, gradually worse. Some of the leg conformation things has gotten worse. Um, on some of these very, very heavy Angus cattle and feed yards, you need to be looking at shade. And I can think of the perfect use for solar panels. Shade feed yards. They work just great. And I'll tell you how to mount them. 12 foot high, north and south, the shadow has to move, otherwise you'll have a big mud hole, and the cattle will get under the sh sh solar panels. And you have to make it 12 foot high. You need a high shade. I want to see animals grazing under solar panels too. You've got to put them high enough so the sheep can't rub on the edge of the panel. I, just the other day, I was out at a ranch, and I got real close and personal with a brand-new solar panel, checking it out um, on a big stand, real fancy one. I can tell you, they're pretty flimsy. Animal absolutely cannot be allowed to... That has to be high enough so that an animal cannot rub on the edge of it, because they will break it. 
but uh, you know, shade for cattle, that's something um, we need to be working on that. When you mentioned height, does that have something to do with airflow yes, too? Yes, the 12 uh, foot height, were, yeah. the 12 foot high does have to do with airflow. Yeah, it's important to put your shades up about, about 12 foot high. You put a shade too low, you don't get good airflow. And then you've got to make sure your shade isn't too wide so that as the shadow moves, you now have a strip where it is always shaded. That will turn into a big mud pie under it. There's some things we learned in the 70s that I'm pretty sure are, are still true. Um, but I'm concerned about genetics. Um, maybe we have to breed some hardiness back into some of these animals. That may be something we have to do. The other thing I'm getting really interested in is grazing. And I was really interested in the speaker yesterday talking about cow size. Slick coat, smaller cows. See, a lot of these cattle that are getting bred for Mr. Big Gigantic Meat has a gigantic sister you can't feed on extensive ranches. We've got areas of eastern Colorado where they're buying the red Angus now because the blacks are just too big. And you're going to go broke feeding them hay in the wintertime. And I don't care if it's eastern Colorado, um, Kansas, uh, 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 Nebraska Sand Hills, or Montana, or Kentucky. Those are areas where um, you can't feed these gigantic cows. Now, when it comes to bad things going on, one bad thing on getting cattle sick that's gone on for the whole 50 years that I've been in the industry is um, weaning calves on the truck and dumping them at the sale barn. And they've got no vaccinations, and when they get to the feed yards, they're guaranteed to get sick. Now, Beef Quality Assurance for years has been saying, um, vaccinate. 45 to 60 days before shipping, get them weaned, get them to learn how to drink out of a water trough, and then when they get to the feed yard, they won't get sick. But as long as you have a marketing system where a small rancher, and unfortunately the small ranchers are the worst at doing this, they got 20 head of cattle, dump them at the sale barn, and 10 days later they're sick, or maybe some of them dead, and there's somebody else's problem. You see that loss has been passed on. And this is, unfortunately, is just as bad now as it was 50 years ago, where other things like handling, that's improved. But then as the handling is improved, I'm more concerned now with, you know, some of this heart failure stuff, um, shade for, um, for feedlot cattle, something we need to be doing. I think solar panels are going to be just great for that. Wow, that's great. Uh, um, you know, one of the things... And that's that a paper you probably want to yeah. have. That's my grazing paper right there. Okay. You might want to have that. And ah, then this thanks. paper right here, I, have to print it I off. talk about, you can have those. Um, wow, look at this. I'm getting, I'm getting, yeah, uh, getting all those, sorts of candy uh, up here. When that, so, this five domains paper is all about measuring things like lameness, body condition scoring, easy things we can measure. So, so you know, farmers aren't stupid. So as you talk about these uh, problems, you, you, you kept mentioning Angus, Angus, Angus. I realize, you know, in our country right now, if it ain't black, it's not... Well, and that's marketing, because I can remember in the, yeah. in the 60s and 70s, it was all Hereford, and yeah. you had to deal with the pink eye issues. Right. But the thing about that small Hereford cow, I lived in Arizona all through the 70s, she'd give you a calf every year. Yeah. Feed her cardboard, she'd give you a calf every year. Right. Feed her cactus, she would always give you a calf. So, so, so because the black, the, the Angus have become the, whatever, the standard in the industry, um, they, they are leading the industry with with the problems that the industry has got. So why, why have cows, why have they gotten so big? Well, because a big cow is, um, it costs the same amount of money to slaughter a big cow as a smaller cow. And, and you see the meat likes the big cow, but I'm the one who now saying she's got a, that steer has a big sister that we cannot feed out on these ranches. They're just yeah. too big. And then I, I listened to the speaker yesterday saying, you know, light-coated, slick-coated, 900, I think he said 900 or 1,100. I didn't hear the other end of it right. But these gigantic cows in most parts of the U.S. don't work very well. Yeah, so, what's, so, so uh, you, you've confirmed my take on it. My take on it is that the, 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 the processing industry, the fabrication industry... Um, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna fabricate meat, if you're gonna take a carcass and you're gonna make t-bones and ribeyes and stuff out of it, um, fabrication is more efficient 
with a big carcass well, because than a little it, carcass it because you're doing with deep, right. deep clothes, not Legos. And so the, the farming end, the farming end, the production end has allowed the processing end to, de to determine what well, they, they, of, they'll that's pay that's more for this animal. You see, and in fairness to the processing end, I say travel's a great educator. I'm in the big processing plants, but I also get out in the field on small ranches. I was out in the Kentucky area with a vet out in small ranches. So I'm going back and seeing both. That person that works in that processing plant, it's all an abstraction what happens on ranches. They've been to feed yards, but they don't know where the cattle come from. I, this is why getting out and seeing things is such a good thing to be doing. And then that rancher... Okay, you know, I've heard guys saying they got 20 head of cattle, and they'll go, oh, I made a lot of money this year. I didn't have to do any work. Didn't have to vaccinate them. Dump them off at the sale barn. But then 10 days later, you've got a few dead ones and sick ones because they weren't vaccinated. You've got to vaccinate them and then give the vaccines time to work. They don't work instantly. Another thing, yeah, so, so it, has, it, it has come from the processor back to the producer, and I love what you're saying about, you know, those, those steers have big sisters that become mothers. That's the problem. The, the, and, and now they're out here, 1,900-pound cows, and they just, they just don't function. But you cannot feed them. You will go broke feeding them. I have been out on the ranches just in the last year since COVID. I've been to Kentucky out on ranches. I've been to the eastern Colorado, Montana, a uh, whole bunch of other places, uh, Nebraska sand hills. And you, you just, you can't feed them. Right. You're going to go broke. I just, read a, I just read a fascinating book that's just been published out of New Zealand. Uh, and the, and, and um, I'd like you to comment on this. They said that, um, that I think it was 80% or more of a, of a cow's uh, intake is for maintenance, not production. No, that's right. It's a lot of it. And big cows and, have to eat more for maintenance. And what, where they get into trouble is uh, feeding hay in the wintertime. And what I've noticed, like in eastern Colorado, uh, they've got less hay. You've got smaller red Angus cattle. Then I go into Nebraska, where they got a bit more hay. I'll see some of the bigger black cattle. Well, when I go drive out there on I-80 or on I-70, I look at cattle. Mm -hmm. I actually learn a lot on these drives. Yeah. Yeah. And... And so, um, so what's what's the difference in intake on a like a a hay on a like a thousand pound cow versus a a, a sixteen hundred pound cow? Is oh, it? It's going to be twenty is, is percent, double? ten or twenty percent. Is is it is linear? It, uh, is it pretty I linear based think on? Think anybody's the really looked at that? But okay, nobody. They can't. Feed Even there's something you haven't researched. But it's something they <laughs> they just they just can't feed them, and <laughs> and it's looking at what is optimal. You see, what tends to happen with a lot of this stuff, and this happened with the pigs, is they're just seeing their own animals. They're just seeing their piece of mm. the industry. And that big Mr. Meat that they like, that big sister's not good out on extensive range. Now, I want to talk some about grazing. I've got a paper here on grazing, yep. on grazing cattle, sheep, and goats is an important part of a sustainable agricultural future. And I'm giving Joel copies of that. It's a free paper online. And people have been bashing livestock what a lot of people don't realize is 20% of the land in the world that's habitable, I'm not talking about Antarctica, can only be grazed. There's a 100-mile stretch of eastern Colorado, cannot be cropped, absolutely cannot be cropped. And the only thing you can do is graze it. What are we going to do, not raise food on it? And if you do your rotational grazing right, you can actually improve the land. And I dug up every study I could find where there were studies. Now, there's a lot of people doing really innovative things with rotational grazing on some of these small farms. And unfortunately, it's not getting written up. In every industry, little guys innovate. Little operations innovate. I don't care whether it's a livestock or it's a chat GPT. Little company made chat GPT. Microsoft bought it. Big guys assimilate. But there's a lot of innovation that happens out on these small farms. Write about it. Yeah. Write about it like you write about, well, you, you write about right. how to do things. Right. That's why I've got so many books, too, for both autism and livestock. <laughs> how to do things. Right. I have a book on visual thinking because I'm concerned that some of the visual thinkers that can't do higher math, they're some of your best innovators on some of this farming stuff. 
Yeah, well, the, the beauty of the small farm and the homestead is that m most of them are not depending on it for an income. In other words, they're not, yeah. it, it's not their primary vocation. That's right. A and so, so when you can, when you're not depending on it completely for your, um, for your income, you can, you can afford to piddle. You, you know, you can afford to piddle and tinker and, and, oh, and, right. and mess around with, with uh, infrastructure, technique, model. And so that's why a lot of this stuff comes out of, um, out of this fringe, you know, fringe element well, I remember because there's time, to, there's time to do that. I can remember 15 years ago in the poultry industry, they thought probiotics was just a, a far out nonsense. Well, right before COVID shut everything down, great big gigantic poultry show, there was... Um, big banners on the, on the entrance of the trade show for probiotics. So something that started out as a little guy thing turned into a big guy thing. Now I gotta just tell you, I, I consult for big companies, um, but I, I'm one of these people that wants to communicate with everybody, how do we find solutions to problems? I see solutions to problems. Like yesterday, I saw that storm cloud coming. They moved our book table, and there was the photographic background that said, you know, homestead on it. I saw where that was going to be going. It was going to cover up our books that were put on a forklift pallet, and Brad's knife was going to cut the zip ties. You see, I was already visualizing that, what I was going to do with that photographic backstrop, because we would have had, I don't know, a pallet of books wrecked. That's not something you want to have happen. But you see, that's seeing a solution to a problem, just in a real simple way. Right. Uh, on that, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go a, a little... Uh, another thread here. Yesterday, I really appreciated you, you really digging into fear. Yeah. And uh, again, bec because animals can't, can't sit and analyze like we can. Uh, they don't understand that, well, that light's coming in that door because the sun's over there, you know, the door's open, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I, I wanted to, a thought that struck me as you talked yesterday was I wanted to ask, um, is there a difference at scale uh, again, we're talking, we're, we've got a lot of homesteaders it's here. It's the same. Small scale they, things. They, are, 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 is a herd of three cows, as, um, are, are there any differences on their, their fear, whatever, fear ability versus a herd of, of 500 cows? Well, what happens, or, or three chickens versus, you know, 1,000 chickens? Well, let's just look at the cattle. It's the leader that sees the LED light on the side of the building. It was like when the spider monster appeared at this big, gigantic plant. And every the group lead has animal a leader. stopped. And what would happen with three cows? The lead animal does the stopping. Now, let's say an animal stops and puts the head down to look at the shadow or to look at where the flooring changes, like maybe there's a metal strip across the floor. Let that leader bring the head back up before you push it. The leader wants to look at something, then let it wait and then push it. But the lead animal can make two other cattle stop or... 20 other cattle stop. It's the lead animal that, okay. that, that stops and looks at the thing, and they'll look right at it. They'll look right at it if you bring them up nice and calm. Now, you bring them up crazy, then they just turn back on you instantly, yeah. and then you don't know what it is. But you bring them up calm, they'll stare right at the thing that they don't like. If it's on the ground, they put the head down. If it's off the side, they'll look right at it. And, and the lead animal is one that you're, when you're, when you're moving them, the lead animal is the one that you're watching and playing oh, off I of. Oh, I watch them on the lead animal. Because the rest of them are going to come up. Um, no, well, because no, I told, the, I told the, uh, the manager at this big plant last year, I said, it was at night. They went halfway up the chute and they stopped. I said, I want you to bring up a nice, calm bunch. I want you to watch your leader, see exactly where that steer stops, what he looks at. And he put his cell phone right down where the steer looked at, sent it to me, and I go, hmm, get rid of that light that's on the edge of the building. Little LED light. Yeah. And they got rid of that, and then they went right up the chute. Now, of course, let's say in a dairy where cattle go in every day, the new heifer will stop at that light, whatever it is, and the other cattle will, um, uh, experienced cows will just walk over, maybe a drain or a metal strip on the ground. Experienced cows will go over it. Yeah, because they're, because they're used to it. Yeah. They're yeah. used to it. They've learned to walk over it. Yeah. But All right. your um, inexperienced animal is going to stop at that. Yeah. So we talked about fear. Uh, you're saying that it's always about the lead animal. That's fascinating. It has nothing to do with actual scale or size of anything. It has to do with the lead animal. So I want to go one more step on that. Does fear 
have anything to do with brain size. Like, uh, does can a does a cow get more fearful quicker than a chicken? You know, cow has a much bigger brain. Chicken has I a much smaller brain. I don't think so, brain. biggest boy. I can tell you, a cat's got a much smaller brain, and boy, they can get fear. <laughs> and you get a fur ball in a vet clinic, shut the door on that exam room, walk away from it for half an hour, and then it'll come out under the desk, and maybe you can handle it. No, they. Uh, uh, now you get in dogs for some reason when you get them smaller, like the mini poodle, it's a bit more nervous than the standard. I'm. Mm. Um, I don't know if that has to do with brain size, but um, um, and then just genetically, you can have Holsteins as a breed are calmer than maybe Solaire cattle, for example. But also within a breed, there is a lot of variation in yes. the in the uh, how scared they get. Mm -hmm. You see, both the environment and genetics. Um, let's say uh, uh, that drone swoops down onto the pasture, not something I recommend. The animal with the more flighty genetics will have a bigger reaction. Yeah. Heart rate will go up more. The cortisol, the stress hormone will go up more than the animal with the calmer genetics. Yeah. You know, one of the things that we do uh, whenever we're bringing in, bringing in animals from off farm uh, is we always try to, uh, like say we're buying a, a, a pot belly load of feeder calves, for yeah. example. Yeah. Um, we always try to make sure that we never unload them into a into a corral, into a holding place that doesn't already have an old cow, one of our old cows. That's a real good idea. Uh, we, we just we just have an old cow, and, and when we turn them out in the pasture, we keep that old cow. Yeah. And uh, boy, does that that seems to calm that them down make, as much as anything. Because it's a calm leader. Yep. Yeah. And in Australia, they call those coacher cattle. Coacher cattle. And they yeah. have um, a calm cow like that. But these are things that you can do that are simple things that you can do. Now, the worst thing you could do is just bring one you know, 600-pound calf home and turn it loose in the pasture all by oh. itself, it is going to go berserk. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely berserk. berserk. Yeah, and you can't blame the calf for no, that. No, you can't. Now, that's the thing I'm wondering. Well, you don't, don't get mad at the calf. Realize we created the, the situation to make this happen. I want to, um, we'll have time for, for some Q&A, but I want to I wanna, uh, uh, touch bases with you with one thing here. Um, I was up at, a, I was up at a, um, an adult autism day facility in Michigan. So this was a farm that that handles autism. I'm, I'm, I'm moving a little bit to autism okay, now. Okay, that's fine. All right. Um, uh, uh, this was a farm that, um, that saw the value in, as you always described, practical things for yep, autistic. That's right. And so these were young people who had aged out of the school system. Yep. Well, what, what do you do with them? And so, um, so this, this was... Um, an organization that bought a piece of land, and they had this farm there, and the um, and and the the clients um, were you know were raising vegetables. They had some greenhouses and stuff, and they tried to do animals, and and they were selling everything in the community, and the community was very supportive. Yeah, you know, they had a roadside stand. Well, they were good. they were you know it was it was a wonderful thing, but the animals they had to close down because the autistic clients couldn't handle an animal being slaughtered. Yeah. Speak to that a little bit. So, so, so they ended up, they ended up just basically turning the animals into a petting zoo and then everybody just raised and they just sold produce. Okay. Well, that's, so that, well, that, that, that was positive, but, but, but speak to what, what's, what's going on there? Well, I think some of them, um, I think there's some places have been doing chickens and they've been okay with, um, Okay. Um, you know, it's selling them. Okay. Uh, just because what? They're enough well, of them? Well, then you get is enough of them. And, and uh, so let's say you had 100 chickens and 20 are gone. That's not quite so obvious. Okay. Okay. So, and, so an autistic person is, um, it, 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 it's not a matter of friendship as much as it is a matter of this changed. Is, is that what you're well, saying? Well, not necessarily, but they, if you had 200 chickens, you're probably not going to name 200 chickens. No. Or you have two cattle, that's Bessie or something like that, right. um, that's uh, leaving. Uh -huh. they, they're not as personalized. Right, right. And the thing I want to say, and I want to talk a little bit about autism because we're going to have to go real soon, is autistic kids tend to have uneven skills. 
You might have one that's an extreme visual thinker, can fix any machine, super good with animals, can't do higher math, that's me. Then you've got the mathematical type of autistic person that needs to be moved way ahead in math. And this is in my visual thinking book. And then you have the word thinker that knows all the facts about baseball or some other thing that they're super interested in. And one of the big problems I'm seeing now on the fully verbal end of the spectrum is not enough on getting them prepared for work. You see, work skills are different than academic skills. And around the age 11, they need to be doing a volunteer job, maybe a church volunteer job, where you're doing a task on a schedule outside the family. That's really important. They've got to learn that. And I'm seeing too many parents overprotecting where kids are not learning shopping. They're not learning any basic skills. And the, now let's talk about some things where we do need some accommodation. Um, I have no working memory. So any task that involves a sequence, I need to make a pilot's checklist. Um, let's say I had to learn how to be a gate agent at the airport. Okay, so a lot of people can say, now this is how you do the computer for check a bag. I can't remember that. I can't remember that. I'd have to write down those keystrokes, go home and memorize them. Now, something that's simpler, I would need a little pilot's checklist. And that's something that, that's a, an essential accommodation. The other thing is, unlike a computer that's an Intel 286 with a very, very big memory, so I'm not gonna be very good on the McDonald's takeout window where you have this super fast multitasking. Those, I wanna keep them away from that. You see, what I've tried to figure out is where, where we really do need to do some accommodation. Now, learning how shopping, yeah. And then some autistic kids are sloppy about hygiene. There's a scene in the HBO movie where my boss slammed down a deodorant and said, you stink, use it. Well, that's, you gotta clean it up. It's fine to be eccentric, but you gotta clean it up. And on some of this sensory stuff, if the kid's afraid of something like a vacuum cleaner, let the child turn it on and off. And when the child can control the noisy thing, it may go from the feared most horrible thing to the favorite play thing. I just talked to pam some parents last week with a leaf blower. It went from the most feared thing to the favorite thing to play with. When they could control the loud noise. So... Uh, it sounds like a homestead is a great place for an autistic child to absolutely, grow up. Absolutely, absolutely. Because you've got chores, yeah. gathering exactly. eggs. Uh, exactly. Yes. You've got that very practical, yeah. ta tactile, practical uh, stuff to do, and it's and it's needful stuff. You know, well, that's you, you right. Know, you know you're contributing. And when I was working out in the big plants and we were putting in equipment, I worked with two metal fabrication shops, big ones, that had equipment all through the industry, and the guy was either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD owning shops, you know, now what I'm seeing today is the saying, well, special ed kids can't go and shop class because of the insurance. Well, I worked with people who are now retired. The special ed kids owned the shops and had 20 patents each, and the stuff was out there being used in beef plants. Wow. You see, this is where I go back and forth between the worlds. You know, this is something I think it's really important to give a perspective. Yes, I work at big companies. Yeah, I'll tell you, my clients at McDonald's and Costco, I better, um, I better um, disclose that. But I like going back and forth to all different kinds of things. Because one of the things I really like in my different kinds of minds is how a visual thinker and a word thinker can collaborate. Most of these shops had to have a word thinker to run the business side of the shop. Like build customers, for example, stuff like that. Wow, so it, uh, so it does take all kinds. We're, gonna, we're close to end. Is there a, is there a question? Here's a question right here. Yeah, let's just get a few questions. We've got about yeah. 20, maybe 15 minutes 15 left. 15 minutes or so? Yeah. Um, I have to, well, I'm not looking, uh, I'm not doing calls on my phone. I'm just checking the time because unfortunately we've got uh, real tight on time. Thank you so much for sharing your, your heart and your wisdom. Um, two questions. One, when you've got that bull calf, at about what age do you band them or castrate them? I'd like to do it right away. Okay. And the second one is um, if you've got a Longhorn Angus 
heifer that you want to raise up. Well, for... the heifer's fine. It's only a guy. I can keep the heifer. He's fine. Right, right, right. Keep the heifer. I want she's fine. to. What do I breed her with to, to keep? Because she's a healthy little girl, and she's got a good personality. What what breed of cattle is she? She's, um, uh, daddy was a uh, uh, black Angus, and mama was a uh, um, longhorn. Um, and we dehorned her. We want to breed her, but we want to breed her smart. Well, the thing that you probably don't want to get something that's too big. Mm -hmm. And so this is why some ranchers have gone to Red Angus because they're, the Red Angus haven't gotten so big. See, one of the problems we got with some of the Black Angus cattle is um, they're not, they've got Simmental and some other big cattle genetics in there because you need, just like the speaker said yesterday, you don't want a big humongous cow. And it's also important to get something that's going to be easy calving. Because you don't want to deal with a cow that has dystocia and maybe dies or is injured. You don't want that. You want animals that are easy calving. The other thing is, on the heritage breeds, the thing that concerns me is um, people trying to make them too much like commercial cattle. That's a mistake. Because I think in the future, we may need some of their traits for hardiness. Because right now, one of the ways to get rid of some of the antibiotics, and antibiotics are now on prescription, is to... Um, breed some hardiness in. That means build up the, immu the immune, the military. But you're going to have to back off on the economy. See, the problem is everything takes energy. All of this stuff takes energy. Nothing's free. And so, um, I'm, so you've got a heifer now that's an Angus Longhorn Cross. Um, you know, that's uh, I probably... How about a red angus, something like that? I don't want to get them too big. See, this is the thing that's a problem. And there's a few parts of the world where big cows work. I've been to a place in England where they work, but most of the parts of the world, they don't work that well. Yeah, some of the, there are some places in the world where there's enough pasture and stuff to feed gigantic big cows. But I can think of eastern Colorado is not one of them. And in, even in Missouri, where you've got more grass, I just was at a Bolivar, Missouri, a beautiful ranch there, and uh, they want a more moderate-sized cow. I, I think, too, that, um, that you've you got to be careful about bragging rights. I mean, one of the things that, that farmers love is, look how big my calf is, you know, at weaning. But um, uh, if, you're, if you're looking at, at optimum, it's all about ratio. Did the cow wean a calf half of her weight? Well, if a cow weighs 1,600 pounds, that means she's got to wean an 800-pound calf. But if a cow weighs 1,000 pounds and weans a 500-pound calf, that's way more efficient. I think you'd agree, Temple. Uh, it's, it's more optimal to have a 1,000-pound cow weaning a 500-pound calf than a 1,600-pound cow weaning a 700-pound calf. Yep. And another thing... Why did we get into calving in the wintertime? I, mean, I always thought that was crazy. Well, the reason why a lot of people got into doing that was to have a heavy calf for the fall sales. See, now some of our ranchers are realizing kind of the folly of, a, of a calving in February where you've got to do it inside, otherwise your animal's going to freeze to death. Uh, people are getting away from that. You know, it was having a heavy feeder calf to sell in the fall. Now, if you're growing them all the way through, then that doesn't matter anywhere near as much. And we need to be showing the world good things we can do with grazing. I mean, we have a very big part of Colorado that's only grazing land. There's a 100-mile stretch. If you go out uh, east of the airport, we get 50 miles out from the airport. It's a 100-mile stretch that can only be used for grazing. And you get people that say cattle take up too much land, what am I going to do with that 100-mile stretch of eastern Colorado? You see, one of the problems with a lot of the verbal thinking, it gets way too abstract. Way too abstract. Verbal thinkers tend to overgeneralize. I'm seeing that land. Uh, I've heard a lot of the other speakers here talking a lot about nutrition and how the, uh, there's a lot of depleted uh, soil and stuff like that regarding uh, what ends up uh, getting into people's diets and how that affects 
uh, a lot of times how people think. And I was wondering if you had any uh, insights into either supplementation or just diet for your own experiences and how that affects your thoughts and your Well, there's uh, one processing. thing on a lot of these supplements. Like you get in Missouri, you got fescue. Then you've got other places where there's mineral deficiencies. I would recommend getting extremely good local advice. And it, some of this stuff is very localized. Also on the pasture stuff, you know, a, a seed mix that works well one place is horrible somewhere else. Local advice from extension, local advice from other people in the area that have been really successful. And that's the main thing I would recommend that you do. I can't hear you. Okay, well, they, they uh, well, I know that, uh, you know, with the fescue, some animals are more resistant to it than others, but then if you breed a fescue grass that doesn't have the endophyte, the grass is weak. You see, this is where you've got a trade-off. The fescue makes the grass strong, but it can be, make cattle sick. Okay, now I can't hear what you said. Something about autism. Uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, more along the lines of how it affects anyone with autism, for instance, like magnesium deficiencies, raising people's uh, uh, anxiety and well, things like that. Well, magnesium can sometimes help on, help on anxiety. That can sometimes help. Another thing is an um, autistic person that's anxious, lots of exercise. Getting out and doing hard work, that can be really helpful. Let's see how we're doing on the time. I hate to keep looking at this phone. Okay, we've got a few more minutes. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering, do you, what would you suggest if you have a dog you're trying to train to be in an electric fence with sheep, but they're terrified of the electric fence? The dog is terrified of the electric fence? Yeah. And I, well, how close will he get to it? Well, at first we put him in with the sheep. But then after he touched the fence, now he's terrified and he won't go anywhere near it. What's anywhere near it? Uh, see, this is where a lot of my behavior problem, I gotta have more specifics. Uh, maybe like 20 yards. Oh, that's far. Yeah, that's far. Um, you know, maybe he'll gradually learn that he can get near it. Another thing that's gonna be coming up in the future is virtual fencing. At where they have a GPS collar, the cows have a GPS collar, and that's going to be good with grazing rotation. But we've got to work on how we train the cattle to it, because you don't want them to learn that they can run through it. Um, I saw one system that had little solar panels on the, on the top of the harness here, so that the battery would stay charged, because that's been an issue. Um, Maybe you could talk about yeah, uh, clarify just to make sure you've got your sheep in a in a net electric net, and so when the dog is terrified of the fence twenty yards, the whole circle is hardly the, the whole circle is hardly more than twenty yards. That's the problem. The dog the dog can't settle down with the sheep in the electric net because the dog can't get far enough away from the electric net to settle. A am I am I catching? Well, that and we can't get him to go inside with the sheep anymore because he's yeah, so be, afraid. Be, be, because he's too close to the electric net and, and inside with the sheep. Is there, do you have other thoughts well, now, now that I've kind of helped clarify that? I think the other thing is what might help is to make an electric net that's really big. And because where I've seen some really bad stuff go on with electric fencing is putting animals in very small enclosures with electric fencing. I've seen cattle racing up and down. Um, because they couldn't uh, get away from an electric fence. So what you might try is put him in a really, if you have enough of that netting fence, a really big enclosure where he wouldn't be so scared, and then gradually you can make it smaller, and the dog learns to stay away from it. That might work. Yeah, I, th I think there's some real wisdom there. Just take the time to make, to make a, a, a circle twice as big so the dog can get comfortable in the middle of it. Maybe with some shade too, you know, and some some feed the sheep can't get whatever, you know, make it really comfortable for the dog, uh, and and then you know they'll do. That's one of the reasons why on our on our farms, uh, we always want to make at least a 16 foot wide laneway, so the cows have eight feet to walk and four feet to the electric fence. So that, so in, when we're moving them from a from a field to a field and they're in a you know in a group in a mob, um, nobody has to get within four feet of the fence 
uh, because they move in way less stress. If you, if you could put them down into a eight foot or 10 foot alley with electric fence on it. Now boards, it's not a big a deal, but electric fence, they don't want to be that close to a fence. So, so uh, you, yeah, you want to get them far away. Another question. No, that's a really great idea. Hi, I'm raising a 13 year old autistic daughter on a homestead. What is something that you wish somebody would have done for you earlier in your life that could maybe help her succeed later? All right, let's, that's very general. Um, I'm going to assume she's fully verbal. Well, she needs to have some chores that she needs to do. But she also needs to interact with people outside the homestead. I get asked about homeschooling. Homeschooling is fine. But these individuals need to, all kids need to interact with others outside the homestead. And where an autistic 13-year-old is most likely to have friends is friends who shared interests. Maybe they both like chickens, for example. That would be something that would be a shared interest. She's also got to learn skills like shopping. Can she go in a store and just buy something by herself? Those kind of skills are just so important. And I'm seeing too much of not learning those things. Because you know, then when I go over into industry, I'm thinking about the great big metal shop owned by somebody who's definitely autistic. And then we often underestimate what they can do. But there are some things where the multitasking, the working memory, the pilot's checklist, that's a very, very simple accommodation, but it's an essential one. Um, how's she doing in school? Good. She's doing good in school. Very good. But she now needs to start uh, doing some work-type tasks outside the family. Tactile, Tactile. Tactile yeah. But... Learning how to do a job outside the family is really important. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hi. What are your thoughts on using uh, cover scent with cattle when either recombining or changing herd structure, introducing new cattle? I've heard some people using apple cider vinegar or Vicks Vapor Rub or something like that to help with cover. Maybe uh, like cover scent. put uh, stuff on them that smells different to help get them introduced. Yes. Um. Yeah. You know, sometimes things like that can be helpful. Um. I don't want to put them in some little tiny pen where the one that's getting attacked can't get away. That's something you don't want to do. You know, sometimes you can have animals that just absolutely won't get along. You've got other animals where they duke it out, and then they make their dominance order. And then there's others, and I've seen that with horses too, they just uh, never learn to get along. And then you might have to sell one of them. Thank you. Okay. Real quick, thank you for being here. Um, What's your thoughts on the miniature cattle that they're introducing in a homestead situation where you have a smaller grazing pasture? Well, uh, we just got to make sure that in these miniature breeds we don't end up with some kind of abnormalities in them. Like low lining. Yeah, so some of that, and I've heard about some problems that some of those have had. Um, you know, the gene pool's narrow. Uh, just make sure you're not breeding problems. I talked about that yesterday, like bulldogs. Um, in the 50s, the Hereford breed went through a dwarfism. They were breeding for these low Herefords. They ended up with dwarf Herefords. That was a real mess. That mistake got made in the 50s. Just make sure you're not breeding problems. Hi. So I have a, ma a mare that has really bad separation anxiety and is always anxious before we go into the arena. How could I help her fix that and stop? Well, one of the things that can sometimes help is gradually teach her to tolerate increasingly long periods of being away from the other horses. You just gradually start out, you know, five, two minutes, five minutes. That can be done with dogs, too. Because the problem with dogs is I knew a dog that um, never had separation anxiety when the people went to work. But then when they came out of a 10-day camping trip in the camper, where the dog had been 24-7 with them, um, they went to work and the dog ate a door, completely wrecked a door. Um, this is a dog that in the past hadn't done that, but let's just work on gradually increasing the time that is separated from the other horses, very gradually. Sometimes that works. Hi. Um, whenever you were talking about whenever at a dairy farm a cow would be um, just walking down the chute, the experienced cows would walk by the light if there's a light on the side, but a cow who's never seen it before will stop. Would it stop even though it's being left behind by the group? 
so in other words, what he's saying is you've got a new cow in there. She's going to stop at the shadows or whatever where the experienced cows are walking over it. And eventually, sometimes she might just follow the experienced cows and just walk over it. The other thing is give that inexperienced cow time to look at it. Don't force it. Just wait. Let's say they're looking at a metal strip on the floor or something like that. Let them put the head down, take a look, wait for the head to come back up, and just give the new heifer times to look at this stuff. Because if the first time you put them in there and then she sees a reflection on something and you've just been pushing and shoving her, then she's going to be freaked out the next time she goes in there. She can't process it. She can't process it. That's right. What happened to your mic? Oh, he's they have it. Okay. All right. You guys have been great, and thank you. I'm going to turn the corner here for a second. I can't help but wonder, have you come across a conference or a meeting where you were with Bill Gates? and got to share your ideas, and how did that go? Well, I was at a conference where I was in the audience, and I watched Bill Gates. I didn't get a chance to talk to him. Okay. See so, yeah, how we're doing on time. I think we're going to have to... Yeah, we're going to have to wrap it up. Okay. All right, everybody. Dr. Temple Grandin, an American treasure. What a privilege to be able to spend time with her. And I'll be over at the book table for just a few minutes before we have to go. Okay. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the rest of your day.